keeps popping up. I don't know quite how to stop it, but I'll just keep killing it. Got to go like that. Go like that. Sorry about that. So these, can I start? Excellent. So these are, my, my name is Kenneth Schwartz. I'm dean of the School of Architecture at Tulane University. I've lived in New Orleans for a little over six years now. I came here because of the amazing things that were happening in the city and, and, and the real needs that existed in, in New Orleans uh, in, in 2008 when I came. President Cowan, the president of Tulane, recruited me and my wife, who's also a professor, to come here. And a lot of folks uh, came to New Orleans post-Katrina or came back. People who grew up here who had gone away and then they come back afterwards. And we were part of that process that's still ongoing with people who really fall in love with the city and understand what's possible here. So um, I'm going to talk just briefly about the School of Architecture here. Urban will catch up and we'll do some questions and answers. But what I've got is um, you know, an amazing story of a School of Architecture that basically redefined itself as a school that was fundamentally, is fundamentally engaged with the city of New Orleans in profound ways. This is a group of uh, one, two, three, Six students, yeah, six students of about 12 who are on top of the most recent house that we built. You can see they haven't finished it, that's just the roof. And you can see downtown New Orleans uh, in the background. Um, this guy on the left is supposed to be wearing a hard hat, so he's in big trouble, but um, he graduated, so he's okay, actually. Um, we design things, we build things, we engage the community. These are fundamental to what we do, and most schools of architecture don't do this in exactly the same way we do. Um, innovation and community are very important words for us. We think about how we can work with the community effectively and how we can also take conditions and move them forward. Not necessarily, for example, replicating a shotgun house, but thinking about how a shotgun house can lead us to a more modern interpretation that's more energy efficient, that's more conducive to family life today as opposed to 19th century life. This is a design review. That's how architecture students learn. They do work. You can see there's a model that this young woman has created. And there are four uh, smiley professors who are analyzing her model and providing commentary and critique. Musicians work this way. Uh, writers work this way. Creative uh, people in general work in a way of kind of call and response and a way of understanding how they're doing what they're doing through the lens of people who are experienced and who are helping to nurture their careers, as these four professors are. This is uh, another project. We don't just do houses. This is in the um, upper Ninth Ward, and it's the Guardians of the Flame Institute. And Guardians of the Flame is a Mardi Gras Indians group, and this is actually a place that Mrs. Harrison had asked us to build in memory of her late husband, Big Chief Donald Harrison. And she was really concerned about losing the tradition, the oral and musical tradition of the Mardi Gras Indians for her husband's legacy, her late husband's legacy, and she came to me when I first came to New Orleans six years ago and said, I really, we really want to do something. We don't know what or how. So we had a group of students and faculty do a vision of what they could do with her thoughts and her, her daughter's thoughts about what's possible. Fast forward three more years and we started building a, a sort of a band shell classroom for her on the site adjoining her own house. And uh, it's up and running and open functions. There's, I should have gotten pictures of... of uh, of that place in action. This is our design studio, one of our design studios. That's how architecture students work. They make a mess and uh, they create things, they draw, they do computer work, and it's just, that's, that's typical of any architecture school. And it's a very vibrant and vital area to be in. That's uh, on the corner of Saratoga and 7th in, the, in Central City. That's one of our urban build houses. So you can see what it looks like. Those are hurricane shutters. They experimented with polycarbonate as a way of sliding back and forth to protect the house in the event of hurricanes. She, she uses it actually for privacy, or when she's feeling public, she opens them up and sits on her porch like, like any other New Orleanian. We're all about creating positive social change, and we've been working on this in various ways now for ever, really ever since the year after Katrina. This is Grodat Youth Farm. Do any of you know Grodat in, in City Park? That started as an idea just as a, a, an idea, actually, truth be told, President Cowan wanted to do something, and he actually, he and his wife offered a small contribution to get it started, and that led to more and more people falling into the sort of dream of creating a place that could empower youth, high school youth, to have an after-school opportunity for which they're paid. They learn skills 
through urban agriculture out in City Park. And I would encourage you to go there and see what they're doing. It is absolutely amazing. We designed and built the campus. And there's an amazing woman named Johanna Gilligan who runs the um, actual program, which is really a sort of a leadership youth empowerment <coughs> program through food. And you can see some of the youth who are uh, there, that's crawfish in front of them, and they're celebrating. We celebrate a lot, too. This is another urban agriculture project. Mr. and Mrs. Lee commissioned this that's in Algiers, and they wanted to take this abandoned property that had a lot of water problems and turn it into a useful, productive garden. It's really a, a shotgun house site, typical site. And you can see the raised planters, and there's also a rain garden off to the side that really solved the flooding problem that they had on that site. You can read about it in the newsletter that I, uh, I think it's, no, it's in the previous newsletter. There's a few copies of 2013. We did this in two, spring of 2013. And sadly, Mrs. Lee passed away during the process of our designing this for her husband and for her. And uh, Mr. Lee decided to proceed sort of in her memory and in her honor. Yes? Is that a site where a house was or where a house is? A house was there at some point in history, but I, I think that's one of those sites that was blighted before Katrina as I understand it. So it was vacant and not contributing to the neighborhood, to say the least. It was uh, sort of like a mosquito factory. And now it's very productive. That, that funny looking roof is to provide shelter for people working when the rain starts coming down or to get out of the sun. But it's also gathering the water and directing it to one <coughs> area to control it and slow it down. That's what a rain garden does. Beautiful. It's also very aesthetically pleasing. We're, we're interested in preservation. This is actually our preservation program. It's a graduate program, one year, and they're off in Cambodia. They do things mostly in the U.S., but they do some work and study abroad as well. Um, this is the only project we've ever done that we don't publish. It, we don't publish its address, and it's because it's for a, an abused, abused women and children. So obviously, we're not going to tell people where it is. Um, but our Emily Taylor, one of our faculty members and a group of students designed and built this, for this organization, it's a safe place, um, a play area, enclosed and, and, uh, and safe. Design thinking is an increasing interest to us about innovation and creating social change through different ways of doing business. It's a sort of a jargony term, but it's a way of using design skills to address problems, not just traditional architectural design problems, like how do you, how do you t attack issues of literacy? That's a design thinking issue that you could tackle in new ways using new creative uh, tools and means. We're working on these issues uh, as an adjunct of what we do in architecture. Our faculty are very engaged. These are three faculty members. Uh, one has her back to you, so you can barely see her uh, discussing a student's model. Uh, Scott Ruff is the architect who designed and led the uh, Guardians of the Flame project I showed you a few moments ago. And then another professor, Michael Crosby, teaching a student over her desk. other examples of the work that students do. Um, every year the students organize and do an event on campus called Architecture Week or Architecture Weekend or A Weekend, they call it whatever they want, totally student generated and they do something provocative on campus. And this is, these are pneumatic structures, they, they're, they're blown up and you can see people inside of one of those and it's right in front of our building, Richardson Memorial Hall. It, it spurs a lot of discussion, sometimes it's sort of in the face of the administration and it's great because the students are getting the attention of the entire school university community through their, through their creativity. And then I get in trouble and I apologize mm -hmm. and then they remove it eventually and everything, life goes on. Mm -hmm. Architecture, like other creative disciplines, is a very um, intensive uh, learning process with uh, requires a, a, a very good ratio between faculty and students to be effective and we're fortunate to have such a situation in our teaching. Our students, some students get to study abroad. It's important as part of becoming an architect and a well-educated architect. That's our program in Rome. We have a graduate program in sustainable real estate development, which is uh, unique. There's no other program that has that name in the United States. There are other one-year real estate graduate programs in the U.S., but ours is very focused on how do you rebuild a city? How do you regenerate an urban core of a city? We're not interested in doing um, greenfield developments. Walmart's out in the field somewhere. We want to do things that are about the strength of a city and the core. This is also out in City Park. We just finished this one last year. 
Um, also, Emily Taylor was the lead professor on this with a group of students. It's a ropes course in City Park, a leadership course. I don't know if you're all familiar with how leadership and team building can be developed through ropes courses. Well, this is one out in City Park, and it came to us because the GRODAT youth do uh, leadership and bonding uh, teamwork as a part of their program using ropes. And so they didn't have any shelter, so they were baking out there. And uh, I've got to get rid of this. And so we provided this. These are yield signs. You know, we all know yield signs, the yellow ones. There are triangles. Well, they're really cheap. They're made out of aluminum. And if you don't paint them, they're beautiful. And these are yield signs joined together by this joinery that they designed. It's also on the lecture poster that you'll see. And it provides shelter, shade, and a classroom for them to work. We're a small school, about 350 students, undergraduate and graduate. A lot of what we do is about New Orleans, not exclusively, but we're very much connected to the city. And Tulane University has been from its inception, and it's a big part of what we do and why we do what we do. This is a view of GRODAT. On the top is a student's rendering of the, the vision, if you will, the, the inception of this. And the bottom is a, is a picture of the outdoor <coughs> classroom that's there today. Um, Irvin was part of the celebration that we had uh, two years ago when we opened this, and it was a great festive occasion where we finally got this thing almost complete, and it's been up and running and going gangbusters ever since. This is one of our earliest projects in Holly Grove, which is a food and farmer's market, and that's an outdoor classroom, shelter again, and you can see how it collects water uh, so that they can use the water for irrigation behind. This is Cordula Rosser Gray. She was the lead professor on this one with a group of students, several students. And then for those of you who want, there's, I'll, I'll show you and a couple of you can take a review. These are just collections of student work that we publish because a lot of what I've been doing since I've come to Tulane is really just celebrate the amazing things that students and faculty are doing in the community. And it is really a remarkable story of a school of architecture that's really about New Orleans and about strengthening and, and making a smarter city through the work that our creative work that our students and faculty do. And in the end, you know, it is all about New Orleans and what can we do to reinforce the great traditions here while innovating and pushing those traditions into the 21st century and beyond. So um, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction of what I do, what I spend a lot of my time doing, which is to create opportunities to help support opportunities that take place through our regular teaching and then a lot of our extracurricular things that happen because we're in such an amazing city. So um, that's my brief presentation, and someone will help me figure out how to shut this down. Maybe I can do it. Look at that. Amazing, huh? I was told I have to have my mic, so I'm taking my mic. See? You good. <laughs> Well, how about a round of applause for his good day? Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about the job of being the dean of the School of Architecture. Maybe if you give us a little bit about what a dean does versus what a professor does and the provost of the university and how that works with the... Yeah. The, in our school, the dean really oversees all of the academic uh, activities. I'm sort of like the CEO, the chief academic officer. CEO would be chief executive officer, but I run the place. And what that means, like any person who's in a leadership position, is that I do a lot of delegation so that I can choose the things that I do and that I can uniquely do. So to answer your question, uh, a lot of what I do is to build opportunities. Um, to find funding and, the, and to help in finding the right connections so that we can be effective within the work that we're doing, whether it's in our core curriculum and our teaching mission, the normal teaching mission, if you will, or if it's in all of these other dimensions that have really distinguished Tulane in, in so many ways. <coughs> the, a faculty member does teaching, research, and service. That's the, the normal triad for full-time uh, faculty members in any institution of higher education in the U.S. And I remember when I was a regular professor at my prior institution, I, I always thought of it as the greatest job in the world because, I mean, I like my job right now, but at that time I was teaching a lot. I was doing my own creative work. I had a practice doing uh, large-scale urban design work throughout the eastern uh, seaboard of the United States. That was my, my research and creative work. And I did a lot of service. 
Uh, so I had the luxury of the ability to do all three of those things and to do it in, with a lot of um, uh, commitment. So my service back in those days was I was on the city planning commission for the city of Charlottesville. Um, I, I taught at the University of Virginia for more than 20 years before coming here. So a faculty member who's active and, and who's really do, hitting on all the marks is really at least doing three things if you can generalize what they're doing. The, the thing that distinguishes Tulane is that we don't just do service. Uh, we do community engagement, which is really taking service a step further. You know, it's not, um, in my case, I served on a planning commission and it was, it was rewarding and important. But as you heard me just present, we have faculty members who are doing projects for nonprofits in the community. That's engagement. That's really getting, getting involved with a group that needs help, that has a vision, but they don't know quite what to do with it, and to make something happen. It's very entrepreneurial, and it's, it's engaged. It's learning from the community and not just sort of doing something to the community. The provost is my boss. You know, in a university, there's a president usually, or a chancellor. It's called different things. Provost runs the entire academic enterprise for the university, and the deans report to the, to the provost. And I've been very fortunate to have an incredible provost, and we had an incredible president as well, who just stepped down at the end of June. But my provost is someone who hired me in 2008, and thankfully he's been with us the whole time, and he's been really <coughs> guiding all of the units of the university very, very effectively. Tulane is really much farther along in our academic trajectory now than we were in the immediate aftermath of Katrina, where we were just trying to get back on our feet like everybody else. Talk about uh, the type of student that enters the architecture school. Our students, a typical profile of an undergraduate student at our school is that they've probably mostly known from an early age that they, want, they think they want to be an architect. It's kind of like musicians. They've done something that indicates that they have <coughs> some talent. They're passionate about learning by doing, not just by book learning. And they, they're resilient and curious. You know, I think creative people are like that in general. But you know, a typical architecture student is someone who's been drawing since they were you know, eight or nine. Or, or, and then, and I, I was pretty typical when I was young. I, I pretty much knew I wanted to be an architect by the time I was 12 or 13. And I, I, you know, I, I was naive, like anybody is at 12 or 13, but I started doing lots of drawings of things that interested me. And uh, I, have a, I have a blog that you can check out on our website if you want, but I wrote one blog in relation to sort of reflecting on our new students coming in and, and how much I could relate to them because way back when, when I was their age, um, I used to draw, I, I grew up in a neighborhood that was about less than a mile away from a very famous Frank Lloyd Wright house in a, in a city that has only one Franklin Wright House, and a very famous building by a, a prominent American architect named Louis Kahn. And, and I used to just draw those buildings, and I didn't know they were famous architects at the time. I knew about Wright, but I didn't know about Kahn. So I, I drew them like an architect draws them, but like a clumsy architect. So our students are curious, and they're innovative, and they're ambitious, and they like to make things and do things and make a mess. Uh, you, I showed them slides of the studio, which is, I love design studios because it's just a sort of reflection of creativity, sometimes gone awry, but it's, it's exciting. Graduate students are a little bit different. You know, we have a really great graduate program in architecture, and, you know, they're older, and they've made a conscious decision after their undergraduate degree to study this profession. So they're also curious and ambitious and innovative and creative, but you know, it's a different matter when you decide to go to graduate school at age 24, 26, 34, wh however old you might be. So the atmosphere in the graduate program is a bit different. But I think they're motivated here by the same, exact same issues of how can I connect my education with real world challenges in New Orleans as our kind of our laboratory, our place to work. So we get great students. We're really um, very, very lucky and very privileged to be where we are right now if I were in some other place, it would be a very different proposition attracting the kind of people who we've been successful in attracting here. What type of person is perfect for the profession of architecture? And going even further, because we discuss this a lot uh, in the board, what type of person should not engage in a field of architecture? Uh, the perfect person is a person with empathy, 
uh, creativity and uh, confidence and humility all wrapped up in one. I mean, the, you cannot be a good designer without having uh, a thick skin in some ways because it's a tough process with any project to get clients, the community, building officials, financiers, everybody who's involved with the building process has an opinion. I mean, architects are not like surgeons. A lot of people don't go running around saying that, you know, I know how to operate on you better than, than you do. You know, pe people may have opinions about surgery, but not very many. <laughs> Everybody, it seems, has an opinion about architecture, which is both a great thing for our profession, but also it's a challenge sometimes. So I think you need to be resilient and able to be flexible while also pursuing your ideas with commitment and persistence. Great architects do that, and they do that with a lot of design skill at the underpinning of what they're doing. It's not just PR. It's, it's real substance to what they're trying to accomplish. The, in a way, the flip side of it is, you know, architects who are uh, arrogant in a way that, that sort of causes them to see their work in a singular vision without recognizing that there are forces that matter, whether it's budgets or whether it's community opposition to something about a project, or just people who are genuinely debating how a project should come, to, come together. You know, architects who don't listen are hugely problematic. And you know, some, a few of the most prominent architects have that characteristic. And you might ask, how have they been so successful? L let's use Frank Lloyd Wright as an example. He, he was a terrible human being. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you want to read a biography of Wright, and there are a bunch of them out there, he, he was just awful you know, in, in virtually every respect, except he was a great architect. He designed things brilliantly. And he was you know, 10, 20, 50 years ahead of his time and had a vision for what he was doing that was genuine. So I don't um, excuse his behavior as a human being uh, or with respect to his family or anything. He was, he was despicable. And he was a great designer. You know, so there are some people who fit that mold, not too many, and there are more nuanced examples where that, that person just shouldn't have gone into this field. They should have gone into something that, that was you know, isolated and not engaged with the rest of society in the same way. We spent a good uh, amount of time during our discussions this semester um, talking about engaging in the community from the structure of politics. Um, and we've had a lot of guests kind of discuss why the politicians are important. Um, I'd be interested to get your perspective on the student uh, who may be uh, majoring in business or maybe <coughs> majoring in jazz. Mm -hmm. uh, why is architecture important to them? <coughs> um, and what are the uh, benefits and liabilities of not engaging uh, in the architecture that's around you are the kind of designs that are going on on a daily basis yeah. in a community. I, I think architecture is very important to engage at whatever level is appropriate given your situation. Whether if you're a business person, for example, engaging architecture might have, a, probably will have a practical aspect to it for your growing business or something like that. But I think just as a citizen, it matters, any kind of citizen, uh, because it's a social art. You know, architecture is a reflection of community values and, and of things that we care about as a society. So even if it's a private home, if it's a private home in a historic district, there's an interplay between your personal desires and what that neighborhood is about if it's in a design control district. So I use design control district as an example because that's a political act. You know, saying that you're operating within some expected norms within your neighborhood and community means that you're going to conform to some degree or another with the conditions of that neighborhood. So I think um, there's a political dimension to architecture, large and small alike. So there's a practical reason to pay attention to architecture. But from a more sort of uh, purely cultural standpoint, it's part of the fabric that makes up our richness of life. And I think that we're lucky in the in the field that I have because we're both we have this practical application of uh, providing shelter and habitation and safety for people while at the same time it's really it's it's like music it's like painting it's like poetry it's part of how we define ourselves as a culture through a creative through as creative human beings and I think uh, you know there are a lot of architects who 
really get excited about the interplay between those things. And some of the, I think some of the most profound architects, like I mentioned Louis Kahn, who's probably not known by any of you, but he's one of my architectural heroes. He was an architect who was poetic in his architecture. And if you read his writings, he literally was poetic in the way he wrote about his architecture. And you can see it reflected in the expressions that he created. Um, and I think that's why he will probably stand the test of time. And, and history will keep looking at him for a very long time to come. Give us a perspective. You've been in New Orleans now how many years? Uh, over six years, a little over six years. Over six years. Give us a perspective of New Orleans uh, from your lens architecturally. What is it that you see when you look um, at the different creations uh, in the city of New Orleans? Well, the, his, the historic fabric of New Orleans is just unbelievably beautiful and diverse. When I first moved here, I had an image of New Orleans. I'd been here maybe six or seven times over my lifetime before coming here as dean. But I was struck by some very, very clear and strong architectural traditions that are mostly connected to the way that we um, grew as a city coming out of our connections with France, Spain, uh, Central America, the Caribbean, and West Africa. You know, it's just a, it's a blend of uh, traditions and styles and building habits, built ways of building. Mm -hmm. So I saw really strong traditions, and anybody who studies architecture studies New Orleans for those traditions. And I saw a city that was unbelievably diverse. You know, this is not a straitjacket. Tradition here is not a straitjacket. It allows us to look at some of these very strong traditions and say, okay, how can this tradition lead to a 21st century interpretation of these traditions? Most of these traditions tie to the cultural connections that I just mentioned and climate. You know, the challenge of building in a really difficult, challenging environment like ours. And that's really, those are powerful lessons for an architect to understand how the, the world around us informs us culturally and environmentally. So uh, those are the historical aspects. The more modern examples, we've got some great architects in the city of New Orleans. I mean, it's really amazing to see what's happened. I've, it, just in the six years that I've been here, um, there's been a real renaissance of what's happening, both in terms of adaptive reuse and preservation projects that are incredibly significant, like Rouse's downtown. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a utilitarian structure. It was when it was built initially, and it is again now that it's been repurposed as a grocery store. So I look at that project. It was designed by John Williams, who's one of our alumni from the School of Architecture. He's about my age. And John and his client created a vibrant new place right in the center of about 3,000 new units of housing. And it's very innovative what he did. I mean, you look at it now, and it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an older building that looks really, really contemporary in the way it's working both inside and out. And I think he did a great job with it. And the client should be commended, too. So I see a lot of uh, innovation. You know, you look at 930 Poitras. You know, all don't know that building. That's the one with the, uh, the cantilevered um, sky lobby on Poitras Street. It's the lobby that hangs out over Poitras. You can't miss it. And it's, um, it's very dramatic. And the firm that designed that, Eskew Dumez Ripple, uh, you know, the first eight floors are parking. Because you can't do below ground parking here, at least you can't do it affordably. So they got nine floors of parking or eight floors. And then you go up an elevator and you're at the lobby. You know, most traditional buildings have the lobby on the ground floor or the first floor at the highest. They got it way up there, and you, if you go, ever have a chance to go up there, it's wonderful. You get up there, you've got a view back to the Superdome and over the city, and they have a courtyard up there. It's like a new garden up in the sky. It's fantastic, and they're, they're really beautiful apartments, too. So that's an innovative project that's really creating, in a way, a new model of housing in New Orleans. There's nothing else quite like it yet, but there'll be other, other projects that copy it. Tell us the most controversial uh, design conversation that you either witnessed or you had to uh, take part in uh, and what was the outcome and what was the what was the argument about well there they often play out in planning issues more so than just individual buildings there they do play out with buildings too there was a big debate here about the World Trade Center at the end of Canal Street and uh, it's still, I'm not exactly sure where that stands right now, but that generated a huge amount of controversy. <coughs> the mayor wanted to do one thing. There was some opposition from one side. There was opposition from another side. Almost you can't, you're going to get someone upset no matter what you do.
But the question was, how can we take this really prominent building and make it useful? It's, it's, it's I think, almost completely abandoned at this point. Mm -hmm. So that generated a huge amount of public uh, controversy and debate, lots of, uh, you know, I rate things on the blogs and, and letters to the editor. And it was an interesting one, too, because it's a, it's a relatively new building, but it's old enough to seem historic in, in another sense. It's also iconic. You know, it's a building that really has an iconic purpose. And so some people look at it and say, well, okay, the building needs to be renovated. It's in bad shape, but we shouldn't be tearing this thing down. It's been here for a reason. It's there as a kind of marker at the end of Poitras and, and Canal. You know, it's a very prominent location. So that was really... Um, I think that's still unresolved, too. I have no idea where that, that issue is. The one that I, I watched from the sidelines with a lot of interest for a couple of reasons, there was a debate just this past year uh, in the Lower Ninth Ward in Holy Cross about a development uh, project at the Holy Cross School. Mm -hmm. It's a historic building that needs to be renovated and can be renovated. And it also is the site, an incredibly prominent site, right at the levee just sort of off the edge of the Industrial Canal, right at the Mississippi River. So uh, a, a, an architect developer here in town bought the option on the property, Angela O'Byrne. She's actually an alumna of our program, and she was a fellow board member on our board. She stepped down from our board. So she wanted to develop this property, and she needed a zoning uh, a change in the zoning ordinance to make it allowable to do it the density she wanted. One of my colleagues, Maurice Cox, worked with the neighborhood to come up with alternative visions that really lowered the density of what she was proposing. Really, a lot of passions. <laughs> the neighborhood wanted basically a park. In the extreme, they didn't want anything. But they, they came up with schemes that did have some housing. And so, to their credit, they really worked on different ways of showing alternatives. Maurice Cox runs our Tulane City Center, which is our community outreach arm, and basically assisted them with providing knowledge about how you could do th different things on that property. But um, in the end, the council member supported her proposal for relatively intense development. I mean, she scaled down her ambitions as a compromise. And he came, by, came in and supported what she was proposing. And I believe that the planning commission might have been split, but the city council supported it. Give me the top, your top five cities for great architecture. In the U.S. or anywhere? World. In the world, okay. Well, New Orleans would be number one, of course. <laughs> uh, Barcelona, Spain. I absolutely love Barcelona, Spain, and, and I love it for a very specific reason. It's not at all literally like New Orleans, but it's similar in the sense that there's this incredible weave of architecture, landscape, music, uh, a, a, a unique, unique traditions in music, and unique traditions in, in language. I mean, Catalonian is, is, is a different language. It's not Spanish. So, and that's tied up with a whole sense of cultural identity. So it's a, and it's a city that has just flourished since Franco died. <coughs> for all of you, that doesn't seem like news. Franco died before you were born. But the, uh, you know, Franco suppressed Catalonia because they were on the wrong side of the Civil War. Well, some would say they were on the right side of the Civil War. And they lost. So that culture was suppressed for decades. Franco died, I think, in 1975, and it was unknown about how Spain would you know, recover from that you know, dictator passing away, whether the generals would take over or whether the king would swoop in and actually set up a constitutional democracy. That's what happened. So the consequence of all of that was that Catalonia suddenly had the freedom to become itself again. And that plus the Olympics, plus the European common market, produce this incredible combination. It's got great modern architecture. It's got great preservation. The music of Catalonia is, is, is back, you know, and it, it, they were not allowed to speak Catalonian during, the, during Franco's regime. And the music was basically pushed underground because it was a symbol of the, the past from the 1930s. So I love that city. Um, U.S. cities, I don't know. I say New Orleans. I got, Barcelona. I got New Orleans. There's three more. It's hard. Chicago. Yeah, Chicago's a good one. Who suggested Chicago? Yeah, Chicago's great. Um, definitely Chicago. I agree with you. Well, I have a daughter who lives in Chicago, and, and Irvin had this incredible performance in Chicago, so it's a, it's a, which I went to, so I'm a little biased <laughs> on, on both counts. But it's a great city. It has neighborhoods. It's, it belongs in the top five. 
I think so. Okay. I think so. Ro Rome, I'm not that fond of DC. Who asked who? who? I mean, DC is our nation's capital. I respect. Need areas. I respect DC. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, it's you know really seriously the reason I'm not a big fan of DC is I think it's the architecture is uh, is ossified. It's a uh, you know it's it's great classical architecture for the most part, and I, I get very serious when I go there like you're supposed to. But you know it's well not all of our politicians do, but but I do. I get there and I'm I'm in awe of our of our legacy as a uh, you know one of the longest lasting democracies in history, but. It's conservative, architecturally conservative. So I don't like Boston? that. Pardon me? Boston. I like Boston a lot, but that's because my wife is from there. <laughs> so you I'm say not, Rome. Rome, definitely. I'm, uh, we have a program in Rome, and, and I spent, when I was young, I had the privilege of spending a year in, in Italy working. And I, um, I was in Florence, but I spent most of my time in Rome because I was doing research there. And, you know, it's 20 five years old, and when you're that age and you're living in Florence or Rome, it's, I mean, it's very romantic. Shall, shall you say Florence slash Rome? No, Rome's better than Florence. <laughs> and it's because it's more vibrant and it's, uh, you know, it's more kind of intense. New Orleans, Barcelona, Chicago, Rome, you have one more. Oh, shoot. I'm surprised you didn't say Dubai. I'm not fond of Dubai either. No. <laughs> I always hear a lot about their architecture. Yeah, I haven't been there yet, but uh, my wife went there for a business meeting last last year, and I, I know what it was going on there. It's just it's sort of um, Dubai is like a city on steroids. It's a uh, it's uh, a little scary. Um, San Francisco probably. I mean, San Francisco. How many of you have been to San Francisco? It, it's just, I mean, you can spend a month as a tourist in San Francisco, just exploring the neighborhoods and getting lost. Um, the landscape is just spectacular. The weather is ridiculous. You know, it's, uh, it's just, you know, it's totally unexpected. And you, you round a corner and something, I mean, it's just really, it's a remarkable city of all sorts of complexity. And uh, people there are a little bit self-satisfied, but people would probably say that about New Orleans too. I have to challenge you with Asia and Middle East. You just have to, we have to come up with at least two. In a, well, actually, I just got back from China last week. So I was in um, uh, Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, which is near Hong Kong and Hong Kong. And I'd never been to Hong Kong or Shenzhen before. And really interesting just to see the dynamics of growth. I mean, Dubai is growing very fast, but those not nearly as fast and not nearly as uh, outrageously as the cities in China. I mean, Shenzhen, I don't know if any of you know that city, but it's about 30 million now. A city that was maybe a million uh, 25 years ago. I mean, think about it. And it's actually a restricted area where it's growing. Hong Kong is just, I'd never been there before. Have you been to Hong Kong? Mm -mm. Unbelievable. It's just, the buildings are sensational. And this is this is a this is a project. This is a build. This is a city that is a historic port city, where everything is going 30, 40, 80, 100 stories tall. Amazing. They're having a lot of you know big political issues right now. Obviously, sort yeah. of uh, like the Arab Spring. But it's um, it's really architecturally and urbanistically, it is an amazing place. And uh, so, you know, if the cities I know the best in China, I know Hong Kong a little bit now, but. Shanghai is, is similar. I mean, they've created through a series of planning decisions new areas of development <coughs> that are intense and well thought through. And I mean, there's authoritarian yeah. governments have the advantage of just being able to do whatever they want, which is actually a disadvantage in the long term because although democracy is inefficient, democracy means that we care about people in a different kind of way. So, and then Beijing is, uh, is uh, Beijing would not be on my list because it's so much a representation of that sort of governmental model that it's, you go there and you're sort of, you feel completely constrained by the power of the Communist Party in, in China. So Shanghai and Hong Kong. Hong Kong would be on my list. I would put it on a list because it's just, uh, I only spent two days there. I'd like to go back for about two months. Over, Shanghai wouldn't make the list. Um, Middle East? Um, I've, I've only been to one city in the Middle East, and it's um, Riyadh. Um, 
And so it's, never Israel? Pardon me? Never Israel? I've never been to Israel. I'd like to go. But Riyadh is, is, you know, there's parts of it that are fascinating, the kind of interplay between the history of that country and the, new, the newness of their wealth and the newness of their architecture. But um, it's very uncomfortable uh, to go to a country where women and men cannot even interact, uh, hardly at all. And it's, uh, it's jarring. It's a sort of a medieval, it literally feels like a medieval, you're walking into a medieval scene. And it, it's, not a, it's not an encouraging scene. There are some very, very slight moves of liberalization that are starting to happen, but I went last year to, to consult with a new school of architecture that's created by a billionaire, and he's so powerful and so close to the king that he was able to create an architecture school that has women and men. It's the only one in the kingdom that does that. And they don't mix, because you're not allowed to in, in that culture. But the women are on one side with exactly the same facilities as the men on the other. And they have an assembly area where they, they can meet together as a group, but with a glass <laughs> curtain in between in order to observe the, the religious and cultural norms. But this guy, I met him, he's, he's, you know, he would not say that he's pushing the envelope, but that's what he's doing. He's slowly trying to change things in Riyadh. And they're doing a fine job with their architecture school, and the women are really amazing. You know, they, they have to be covered when they see a man like me, but when they're working themselves, they're in blue jeans, they look, you know, like any other student anywhere. Would you imagine that Greece or and Egypt belong on this list? I, I have been to Athens. Um, I've not been to Egypt. I don't know anything about Egypt. You know, in terms of great cities? Architecture, design. Um, Athens, Greece, definitely. I mean, Greece is top. the sort of cradle. No, it wouldn't be in my top five. <laughs> don't, don't push your luck. No, I mean, Athens is, Athens is amazing just from the sort of intensity of its historical significance. And I, I, like a lot of people, regular people and architect people, a lot of my thoughts about cities are really more tied to the emotions and the, the memories and, you know, and falling in love and, you know, things that cities... Um, can be about and my wife and I had a former student who um, later became a, a teacher and she hired uh, her to come teach at the University of Virginia when she was the chairman of the department and she got was getting married and um, she's Greek so we had the chance to go to Athens and her wedding was she's Jewish and Greek in other words it was not a, not a Greek wedding it was a regular wedding if you will but, um, so it wasn't one of those caricature Greek weddings. It's the only people who do that are Greek Orthodox. So she was married on 7707 at 7 p.m. on the Adriatic in a really nice hotel overlooking downtown Athens. So Athens is very special to us, and she's like a, a daughter to us in a way. So um, she's an interesting woman. She's a... Uh, her mother's from Hong Kong, her father's from Greece, Jewish, and the, the family was kicked out of Spain in 1492. You might think that was a long time ago, but if you can prove that you were um, dispersed by the uh, diaspora of 1492 from Spain, you can get a Spanish passport. So she has a Greek passport and a Spanish passport. And now she's an American citizen. I guess she has to give up those other ones. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to loan you Istanbul on your list. I want to go there. I'm going to loan you that one, architecture. We have a mutual friend, uh, Sonny Small, who told me that's absolutely the next place I should go. He went there just to, uh, last year. Central America and South America? Um, I'm very poorly traveled in Central and South America. And the only city I've been to in Central and South America is Rio. Oh. And, uh, and I like Rio. <laughs> I really like Rio. But it wouldn't make your architectural... No. The architecture's honestly not that great. But the city's really interesting, really interesting. And it, you know, I don't know how much all of you know about Rio, but the, the part that I find interesting is the just the extraordinary extremes of the landscape, of the favelas, the sort of the, the occupancy of this um, almost impossible territory or terrain. Mm -hmm. And they've taken it over and they've created their, and there's not 
not a good story entirely, but it's an interesting story to see the way that that city has evolved in the play in the interplay between the sort of acceptable and the unacceptable within that community. And then, and I did stay on the Copacabana Beach, so that wasn't too bad either. Greatest teacher you ever had? Hmm. My grandfather. You mean re regular teacher or just someone who taught me a lot? Greatest teacher. Real teacher. Um, I, I had one architecture professor when I was in college who, well, let me back up for a second. I was like a lot of architecture students. I didn't really know what I was doing when I was getting started. And I, you know, you, you, you try hard, you work hard, you think you've got good ideas, and you pursue them. But it happens at various times for people. Uh, I don't know how old you were when you thought you really started getting it, that you really started like you felt like you had something special. But mine was not until third or fourth year in college. And I, I had a professor who was able to help me to understand what I was doing with a level of confidence that I had not had before. And it's, you know, it was substantive. It wasn't just cheerleading. And he was tough. He was actually one of the tougher professors I had. And, you know, it's an interesting relationship when, you, when you're starting to get more mature as a, as a creative person and you've got, you, you're lucky enough to find someone who, who figures out how to work with you and vice versa. And that person is someone I've kept in touch with my whole life. And he's in Boston now. He left where I was studied at Cornell University. He went, left Cornell and went to Harvard to teach. Then he went to MIT, very good architect. And, um, you know, we keep in touch. He's sort of been um, guiding a lot of the decisions I've made professionally over various moments of my career. But mostly I learned from him just <coughs> sort of typical things that you learn in design. You know, how do you execute your ideas? How do you test your ideas in different ways? And he was a good role model, too. Advice for our students in class today? Uh, professional or personal? Both. Professional advice is, I, you know, probably a lot of you do this intuitively, but pay attention to your classmates, to your professors, to your, to your colleagues, to your friends in ways that can help you as your, and, and ways you can help them. I mean, a lot of times the, the term networking is used. That, it's not a bad term because it really speaks to how you can um, contribute to each other in ways that advance your, your possibilities. And I think people in college don't always realize how important those connections are in sustaining you. And, in, in, and, and sometimes they come back to you in surprising ways 10, 20 years later. So my, my biggest advice professionally is, aside from just taking your study seriously and, and being ambitious, is to really pay attention to others who can be part of your, your world in, in a longer term. And I think that plays out all the time. I see it with my students. And, and you know, there are students who, who, I'm probably intimidating to some of our students because I'm the dean. And there are other students who just come barging into my office. And, uh, and I love it when they do that because um, they're the students who are going to probably send me emails three years from now and tell me what they're doing. And I'll respond. So it's, uh, you know, it's, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Um, personally, something I haven't practiced as much as I probably am preaching is um, balance. You know, being able to figure out how to be um, successful, to be ambitious about what you're doing, and at the same time have a real genuine harmony and balance in your life. And that's something that I, probably everybody thinks about and works on in some way, consciously or subconsciously. And it's much harder than, than you realize. It's very easy to get imbalanced. And there are a lot of techniques that various people use to try to make sure that they, they stay balanced. Um, yeah. What is your favorite word? Harmony. What is your least favorite word? Dissonance. Sorry. <laughs> what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Um, creatively, those are different, all three of those. Mm -hmm. Creatively, spiritually, and emotionally. Or emotionally, definitely my daughters. I've got two great daughters, I'm very lucky. Spiritually, I'm Jewish, um, and I'm not a very um, good Jew. You know, I'm sort of a Jew light. But, uh, you know, I, I do think about, about you know, my, my tradition you know, my spiritual tradition, even though I'm um, pretty pathetic in that regard. 
And then creatively, what inspires me? Uh, gosh, I mean, I've been teaching for, I'm trying to do the math, 33 years. And students, students inspire me creatively. I mean, it's really the greatest privilege in the world, if you're in a creative discipline, certainly, is the opportunity to teach. Because you're constantly challenged. And I, you know, I'm a dean now, so I don't teach nearly as much as I used to. And it's the one thing I regret about being a dean. It's, I've got a lot going on, and it's hard to find time to, to teach a full class. I do give lectures, and I do things that are teaching-like. But I take teaching to mean teaching a whole class or a whole design studio and really guiding a group of students in their growth. And I'm not doing that the way I used to do that previously before coming here. So, but students are amazing. I, I, I often tell younger faculty, a lot of what I do now is mentor younger faculty and help them get started as teachers. But I have very, very vivid memories of when I started teaching the very first semester. And I, at the end of that semester, I was exhausted because I, I didn't realize how hard it was. In, in a good way. And then when I was done, it was a design studio, and then I was done, I realized I probably learned more in my first year of teaching than I did in six years of college, college and graduate school. And, and the reason is very simple. I, I don't know what it's like to teach, to, to work in music as a, as a field, but in architecture, what it does, especially when you start teaching, is it causes you to question and to, to clarify what you're doing. And it really clarifies your own thinking as a designer. <coughs> So in one collapsed year, mm -hmm. I was learning a hell of a lot from other people who were much better teachers than I was. And also I was thinking about how can I take my own experience and make it as clear, as lucid, and as impactful for these young people who are trying to get it themselves in their own terms. And plus, if you're teaching 14, 15 students, they're all different. So it's not like a one-size-fits-all um, enterprise. You've got to really take some core knowledge and skills that are important to everyone and figure out how to make that work with you know one person who's different than another in terms of their their strengths their predilections their 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 passions the things that really drive them and so on so I loved it I fell in love with teaching immediately actually I met my wife in my first teaching job so that was influential too what turns you off uh, negativity of any in any form what is your favorite curse word hmm Um, I don't know. The one I use sort of like as a reflex if I stub my toe, for example, or <laughs> don't like something that's happened, is shit. What sound or noise do you love? Uh, my, my, the sound of my daughter's laughing. What sound or noise do you hate? I don't like the, you know, we don't have blackboards hardly any, anywhere, but, but the sound of fingernails on blackboards. We have all whiteboards in our building now, and it looks like you do, too. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Well, when I was younger, I actually thought about going to law school. And it's, there are not very many architects who would say that. Be, because, I mean, not just because there's a sort of tension between the law and, and the practice of architecture. People get sued and so on. <laughs> but, um, but because they're really very different um, sensibilities and so and I have a daughter one of my two daughters just finished law school so I, I've learned a lot about law school through her and it's very analytical and very uh, rigorous to, you know not that architecture is not rigorous but you know we have analytical things that we do so do you but it's creative you know you're constantly learning from things that you're doing with lawyers it's about understanding the statutory environment the laws Case, case history, uh, precedence, um, dynamics. I mean, a great lawyer, and I think my daughter is going to be a great lawyer. I'm a little bit biased, but great lawyers are able to think about an issue in several different ways without necessarily having, you know, a, a opinions or beliefs that are that are biasing one or the other. Their job is to represent their client zealously, and so a good lawyer can take up a case that has that's completely opposite to their own value system and, uh, and uh, argue it successfully based on the skills that she's developed in school. So I was interested in that. I thought that was interesting that there was a, a way of working that's completely different from the way I had been working. And I was trying to think when I was in my 20s about whether there was a way to blend those two that would create some 
you know, powerful synergy of some kind. Now, I know of only one architect who's done that, and he's really a great architect. And, and actually, he was starting to get some attention at the time, so maybe I was, you know, influenced by him. His name is William Ron. He did the, the theater at Tanglewood. Mm. The new one that's, a, I mean, it's not that new. It's 15 years old now. But Bill Ron was a lawyer, and uh, he, he started out as a lawyer and then went to architecture school because he got frustrated by the grind of corporate law, and he was a creative guy. There are a lot of creative lawyers, but the, the field of law is actually maybe not that creative in, in, as a field. So that's the one thing I thought about doing, and then I realized that was really um, uh, folly. I mean, to do that would mean taking on a, like a five-year path on top of what I had been working really hard at for more than 10 years at that point. What profession would you like not to do? Well, I, my, my mother's no longer alive, but she was a doctor. And my father is alive, and he was a surgeon. He's still teaching, but he's not cutting anybody anymore, thank God. He's uh, 86 years old, so that would be a little scary. But um, I absolutely would not want to be a doctor. I, I grew up with two parents talking about all sorts of disgusting things over the dinner table. You know, can you imagine? My, my mom was an OBGYN, and, and <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm okay with that, but, uh, and my father did gallbladders and spleens and livers. I mean, I've heard so much about gallbladders, spleens, and livers when I was growing up, and that's not an appetizing conversation over dinner. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Hmm. Well, it doesn't quite work that way for Jews, first of all. <laughs> um, so I got a really special reason. Uh, my wife's Catholic, by the way. We've got our bases covered here in New Orleans. She would be able to answer that pretty quickly. She's probably thought about it. She's probably prayed about it. Uh, I have not. Um, uh, good try. <laughs> Okay, I open up the floor. Questions for Dr. Schwartz. Yes. Um, personally, I switched majors to um, to writing and animation because I want to. I don't. I want to create, but then I'm starting to think now that it doesn't really positively affect anyone. Oh, I disagree with you. I think you oh, should wow. follow your instincts. I think writing and animation are two Huge. different things, but together amazingly powerful. I think you're onto something. I'm serious about it. I don't think you have to think about how is this going to be um, applied or how is it going to be engaged down the road. There are definitely ways that that could be hugely impactful. I don't know exactly how that's going to play out for you, right. but first and foremost you need to, I mean I'm saying you should, I don't think you should stick with something just because it's a thought that you had. But I am telling you that they're both really good fields, really good fields. Writing will always be a good field. And animation is a relatively recent field. I mean, Disney's been doing it. He did it yeah. a long time ago, but it's really taken on dimensions now that are incredible and it has, has all sorts of possibilities. <coughs> very, very creative field in both, of, both writing and, and... And writing can be very utilitarian as well. I mean, actually having that as a discipline, as an underpinning, is really, really strong. Uh, most of the... Well, many of the best graduate students I've ever taught were English majors, and they were really focused on re writing, both expository and also creative writing. Let me also add that Nicole yeah. ran our entire team. Uh, was this yesterday? Mm -hmm. Feels like 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Tuesday. <laughs> uh, yesterday, in a retreat, she ran our team through um, a process of animation, which was amazing for us, just as a group. Um, I think that um, when you think of things in isolation, it, you never give the full benefit of what something can be. <coughs> and I absolutely agree with Dr. Schwartz 110% that it really matters what your passion is. And also, if you're the best, it really doesn't matter. You know, you something rather, will happen. Yeah, you'd rather be the best at animation as opposed to being a mediocre lawyer. We have a lot of architecture graduates who have actually moved into animation, in part because <coughs> it's, it's liberating. It's their ways of getting at things that are really um, empowering and, and 
opening possibilities. And I do think architecture students have great skills that they bring to animation. And the most important skills they have are three-dimensional reasoning. They can see and work in three dimensions readily. Now, as a writer, you have some advantages over architects because not that many architects are actually great writers. Mm -hmm. And in fact, <coughs> they're poor writers. So if you can connect those two things, and I suspect you will, it's really, really empowering. Nicole, you want to add anything to that just for the hell of it? <laughs> Next question. It's a good, it's a good question, though, because you're trying to figure things out. Next question. Yes? Do you have any new projects going on around the city besides the... Um, yeah. That's a, I'm glad you asked that. I, I didn't really talk about where we're heading, but I, we've got a lot. I mean, it's amazing. But <coughs> one of the things that we have as a challenge is we've got to choose what we do because there's huge demands on what we could do. And we've got both people, you know, limitations on the people, students and faculty who can be directed. You can't burn people out. You've got to really be careful about how you direct people and so on. So Maurice Cox is the gentleman I mentioned who runs our Tulane City Center, and he really runs a lot of this for the school, not me. But I would say that our biggest project right now is, um, you know, we've opened up a new space in the community, a couple blocks away from the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra Market. The, and it's really, um, it's amazing. It's 7,000 square feet of an, in a historic building. Um, and we're at the point right now where we're part of this whole community of Central City and, and along O.C. Haley and also Barone Street. We're on Barone Street, a block away from O.C. Haley. And so the big thing that's going on right now is how can we start <coughs> working at a larger so-called corridor scale? What can we do that can help that neighborhood? But also, uh, you know, what are some of the strategic projects that are in relation to that neighborhood? And Maurice is working on that and some other angles to that as well. I've got a, a trip next week, or no, two weeks from now, to Washington, D.C., because the gentleman who, I don't know if you know the Hotel Indigo, it's on the corner of Jackson and St. Charles Avenue. The gentleman who developed that is a guy named Tom Baltimore. And he works for Robert Johnson, who is a billionaire, uh, who has a whole set of businesses and enterprises based in DC. Uh, Black Entertainment, uh, BET, I think, is one of his businesses. Used to be, he sold it. He sold it, okay. <laughs> so he's, he's worth several billion, I, I'm, I'm told. Mr. Baltimore is, um, a businessman who runs his entire hospitality empire. I'm, I'm telling you this story because I'm going up to meet him to, to try to talk him into supporting us. Probably shouldn't repeat this too much. I want to get a streetscape improvement plan going. Maurice and I would like to get him to fund uh, improvements in the connection between St. Charles and O.C. Haley. Because right now, it's, you know, if you walk that area, it uh, feels disconnected. Yeah. It's only three blocks. Yes. And you know, we have a vibrant neighborhood that's growing right there. If you look at OC Haley right now and, and do a, a fast forward or a fast back to to let's say two thousand six, it's astounding what's happened there. There's just this incredible convergence of, you know, nonprofit organizations, leaders, regular folks from the community who are really part of this renaissance. It's really amazing. And I couldn't have predicted it when I came in 2003. <coughs> I didn't see it happening. I saw the Ashe Cultural Center and I saw Cafe Reconcile. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do a building, I wanted to get a building down there because I wanted us to be in the community. It took me, you know, five years to get it done. But we now have a space in the community and it's really going to make a difference. I think, I think New Orleans Jazz Orchestra is a huge uh, game changer for what's happening in that, in that area. And it's going to have a sort of ripple effect through the whole city and beyond, nationally and internationally. I think Nojo is, is, is I mean, no, we're not going to have an international impact. We'll have a big impact in New Orleans, and we get a lot of attention nationally for what we're doing. New Orleans Jazz Orchestra has a national and international impact. So we've got a, a totally winning thing going on here where it's hugely important just from a purely local standpoint. I mean, literally, like, within the block, mm -hmm. and then the corridor, mm -hmm. and the whole city. But there's going to be attention that's drawn to us because of this from Rio, you know, and you know, <coughs> every place else across the world. So I'm, I think to answer your question, a lot of what we need to do, and what I need to do, is to help find resources to start 
uh, doing our bit to really do more than just get a 7,000 square foot space, which we have and it's up and running. We have a great leader of this program. Maurice Cox is the head of the Tulane City Center. That's how things happen. You know, you get, you know, students are amazing, faculty are amazing, our community partners are amazing, but this is a guy who I brought to New Orleans three years ago, two, two years ago. Yes. Yeah, and Irvin helped me to recruit him and a couple of other folks here in this community helped to talk him into coming here and uh, he's up and running and everything's going great. And I promised him we'd get a space, you know, in the community if we could put it all together and, and it worked. Now, just to be clear, I think you might have already mentioned this, but the city center program is actually the student program where they go in the community and they build things themselves. So, yeah, so I think you have a copy in your the handouts. It's they build the, everything, houses, sure. and it's, gardens. They've done 80 projects all through the Tulane City Center, which is our community outreach arm for the School of Architecture. And Maurice Cox, this gentleman, I think there's a picture of him in the, in the brochure. He's um, sitting in the, one of their office spaces before we got our big space, uh, working with his students. And you brought some, how many uh, of the reviews did you? I just brought one of, uh, these are just in case anyone wants to take a look and someone can, one of you can grab one, another can grab another. These are uh, publications that we do every two years. And it's literally one project from every design <coughs> studio for a two-year period. And it's, uh, we use it to promote our program so that, um, you know, Tulane is a very expensive private university and we're competing with a lot of other great private universities across the United States for architecture students. And so my strategy here was to just show the great work. And it really works very, very well. If someone is looking at us and they're also looking at Rice University or Washington University or University of Texas Austin, which is public, but also a great architecture program, they can see what, what our students do, and it's not just talk. It's, it's the reality of what, what our students do day in and day out. Admittedly, it's the best projects, because I'm not going to put bad projects in here. <laughs> it's like you wouldn't get a student who's really struggling musically to, to do a prominent performance for you. Uh, last question for Dr. Schwartz. Um, have you heard of, like, EcoCities at all? Yes. Do you see that as a... Like a like a future thing that could ever come to the U.S. because I know China was is doing one, yeah. and there was one in the Middle East, but I think it got shut down within like the past couple of years. Well, the I don't know all of the examples, but I think the trend is sort of a, it's experimental to test out different models and different ideas of how to how to build sustainably in a, a kind of new form. I. I'm much more interested in how to build sustainably within existing cities yeah. and how to work with places that have character and mm -hmm. qualities that are really important to sustain as cultural conditions. And so sustainability for me is vital and our students are very much plugging into those various issues. But I prefer to see it as a more incremental thing where you really need to take stock of what a community is about uh, and how you can build resiliency and and intelligence into the, the, the newness that you're creating and not necessarily thinking that it needs to be a brand new proposition. There's a whole history in, in my discipline, architecture and planning, of utopianism, of thinking about how to create a better future through a newly created world. And that's a very important avenue of um, intellectual and historical study that students engage, and they should. But utopianism is really there not necessarily to be produced literally, but to, to test out ideas and lessons that can be applied in ways that are much more adaptable and contingent. And I think you know, New Orleans is a great laboratory because we're not trying to make everything new as if it's a blank slate. Mm -hmm. And yet I think New Orleans does have a reasonable level of confidence as a place that we can do things differently, we don't have to do things literally the same way that it's always been done in the past. The past is a very good guide and it's a very important um, place for us to pay attention, but it's also not a straitjacket and there are things about the past that actually aren't so good. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, malaria is not so good. Right. And, uh, you know, building sustainably before contemporary building systems meant building, breathing, bu building houses and buildings that could breathe. Well, that worked that worked fine to a degree, 
but if you're actually operating 24-7 and in the climate that we have, you have to pay attention to ways that contemporary systems can create a more comfortable environment for people. So it's things have changed. Mm -hmm. Tehran, did you have a question? Um, yeah, my question, my question is, um, uh, because you're an architect, um, do you prefer to go to places that are uh, aesthetically pleasing over places that are convenient? Like, would you, you know, go further just to be Absolutely. A, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. And I, I, I have never, I mean, I've probably thought about that at some point, but it's so uh, fundamental to me that I would, and that there's another flip side to this is, you know, would I, would I shop at a place that I find to be um, emblematic of things I don't value? Like, like Walmart. And the answer is, yes, I have shopped at Walmart, but I would much rather go to some place that's an experience, that's an urban experience where I can, I can you know, be on the street, not housed in a warehouse. So it, it, yeah, no, I definitely think about that. And it has to do not just with architecture, but with landscape and with just the nature of how cities are broadly. I wanted to mention one thing. You had in your hands something I didn't mention, but the, one of the, I think, most important things that we're working on right now is a whole new minor in social innovation and social entrepreneurship. Uh, Tulane School of Architecture is the home for a university-wide minor, and we have over 100 students at Tulane University, only five of them are architects, who are doing this minor right now. And it's really, to, to let you know what it is, it's how do you empower uh, young women and men to have skills to implement their ideas for social change. Entrepreneurship is about growing something and building something. And the traditional notion of entrepreneurship applied to business is how do you start and grow a business? Applied to social challenges, social entrepreneurship is how do you make a difference in the world? You can make money making a difference in the world. That's, uh, we're educating students on how to make money, but also how to make change. And um, really exciting time because we have incredible students who are really interested in, you know, put it this way, students are, are and, and, and probably this is true for many of you, in my generation there were plenty of students who felt this way, but we didn't have the guts to think that we could do anything until we graduated from college. We, we thought we needed, you'd have to graduate first and then do something. Students want to make an impact now. They want to do something about literacy now. They want to do something about growing an urban agriculture program now. And Tulane is generating a lot of these uh, social entrepreneurs today. New Orleans is an incubator. A lot of people are funding these, and a lot of things are happening in a very spontaneous way. So we're tapping into that. And I, I get to preside over this new program, which is exciting. And you're going to be among the first to hear this. Um, we're also starting a new university-wide center for social innovation and design thinking. And there's a donor's name attached to it, but we're not ready to say who that is. And it will be a major endowment gift to our university to found this new center. So I've been asked by the president and provost to lead that center. And so I've spent the summer figuring out a way to get rid of half of my responsibilities as dean so I could take my other half and become center of, uh, a center director for this new enterprise. And uh, you'll, you'll hear about it. It's going to be a you know, very, very important move for our university. It'll have significance to the city, but it'll have national significance as well. So we're trying to tap into the momentum that we already have underway, and, and they thought I would be in a good position to help make this cross-university center fly within our university. And the, the woman who is the funder for this is um, a visionary. She, she really wants to make something major happen and she thinks that we're the best place to make it happen. So stay tuned. You'll see something about it, I think, within about a month. So just for you to think about with your blogs, uh, one thing, there it actually happens to be an article on NOLA.com right now about uh, my home, which is almost 100 years old. Uh, so it'd be interesting for you guys to read in context with the interview of Dr. Schwartz today. And second of all, uh, Dr. Schwartz, who obviously is extremely busy. There are how many deans at Tulane University? Uh, I don't, academic deans, maybe seven of us? Seven. So one of seven spent almost two hours here with you guys today just because he wanted to share his thoughts and ideas with a different university setting, different group of students. So hopefully your blogs reflect the amount of time that Dr. Schwartz, with his already uh, 
very brilliant list of students could do. He came and spent some time with you guys, so let's hope, hope your blogs reflect that. And uh, he comes every semester to talk to the students in his course. And for that, I am, and I hope you would be eternally grateful for his generosity. So thanks. Well, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm obviously a big fan of Urban's. He's on my advisory board, and I'm on his board. And we've, I think it's safe to say we've learned a lot from each other over the last Absolutely. six years. So I, it's a pleasure to be here. Good luck with your work. Enjoy the class. And you're very lucky to have this guy with you for the semester. Thanks.